cream. To be here at 8 o'clock, I appreciate the encouragement that that is. And um, it's a bit ironic that I'm going to be extending an invitation in this particular hour. But uh, we, uh, we appreciate very much the, the, the plan and the forethought for this. I finished the, um, a meeting in Corpus Christi last night. And after that, we went to uh, the restaurant to eat supper. And after that, I came back and I was packing uh, and to have a little background noise, I cut it on. And I listened to him. And I listened to her. And I thought, how smart West Hill is. If we've needed this ever, it's at a time like this. When we think about the subject that we're going to be looking at for just a few moments tonight, I find it interesting some of the titles of the books that have come out with regard to our study of our epistle, the inspired book of Jude. Uh, Coder wrote a book called The Acts of the Apostates to describe the content of that book. And Hessel Grave, in his book on the subject of Jude, says, What in the world has gotten into the church? And those titles reflect something that I think is true of the content of the epistle. And that is that the material that's found therein is relevant. It's relevant for our times. It was written 2,000 years ago, and yet it addresses the issues that we're facing in 2016. What are the issues of our times? I think that would depend on where it is that we're looking. If we look in the United States, we might say that the issues of our times would include things like same-sex marriage or reproductive rights or health care or the job market or the stock market or education or any number of things like violence and terrorism. Those are the matters that men dwell on and women dwell on in our nation today. But if you were to expand that and ask what are the issues of our times in third world countries? It's a little more fundamental than that. It's survival. It's nutrition. It's deadly diseases. It's dictatorships and the, the power and corruption of their governments that keeps all at the top and returns a precious little so that, that people have very little to even subsist on. But if you were to pan out to the entire globe and say, what are the issues of our times in times like these, in times of any times? You would say things like life and death and purpose and meaning and law and order and family and community. But I do think that there's a special sense in which Jude is a book that we can appreciate in the times in which we find ourselves. The, the occasion of the epistle seems very clear. It's in verse 3. It's the verse that's best known in the book of Jude, where Jude says that he had, was giving all diligence to write about the common salvation, but he found it necessary to write to them, to urge them to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered for the saints. If we were to analyze the content of that book, we would find in that book that he deals with the content of the faith. It is the faith. It's an objective standard that God has laid forth what he wants to be done, and he has made it so that we don't have to guess about it. And our, our previous speakers have dealt with that quite well. And then we would also see that he deals not just with the content of the faith, but the character of the faith. He describes that faith, that it's completed. It was once for all. But it was also comprehensive. It was handed down, and it was directional. It was to the saints. Now, it's, everybody is amenable to it, but the, uh, the writer of this epistle is telling us that he has given their, the readers the information that they need. Then he also deals with the concern of the faith. And in context, it's moral and ethical matters. But by application, it is everything that God has bound. And he also deals with the challengers to the faith. As we look further, we see that those challengers of the faith are those individuals, those people who had crept in unaware. And they had denied. And they had turned to people. And so Jude writes on that occasion for that reason. It is helpful for us to look at a couple of matters before we get into the meat of the rest of the epistle. We could look at the author of the epistle, and as we do, we could make a pretty good case 
for the idea that this was written by the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he would be the Jude of Mark 6 and verse 3. We could compare the first verse of his epistle and the first verse of James's epistle and see them as brothers, all three of them as brothers. And if so, it would be interesting to think about how Jude had developed and grown in his understanding and his emphasis on Jesus from a time like when he, like James, would have at one time opposed him. He glorifies him in this epistle. We could also look not just at the author, but we could look at the audience and find it very interesting that they are definitely Christians, but we don't have a physical location for them. But we know that they're being pressured and we know that they're being assaulted by a message, a teaching that was uh, forcing them to look away from Christ and look toward the world. And then we could look at the aim of the epistle. And Jude is writing both to warn and to encourage The key words and the phrases that make up this letter help us to see the nature that he's warning them about certain things and he's encouraging them to do certain things. And so as you look at the epistle, you would see him use words over and over like ungodly and love and Jesus Christ and Lord and salvation. And you'll see several allusions to judgment and eternity. And there are a lot of specific examples and locations of those who are both the godly and the ungodly. And when you take all of that together and you set up that epistle, you see the occasion to exalt the, the word that has been revealed to a people who are being pressured by the world to turn their eyes away from Jesus and turn it toward the world and follow the world, there are three important truths that we need to remember as we look at the rest of the epistle. Verse 5 through 19 show us why we are to obey that command in verse 3. And verse 20 through 23 show us how it is done. There are three things that this epistle reveals to us that I want to share with you tonight that I hope will encourage you. As we live in times like these. The first truth that we need to appreciate tonight. Is that the world has always been the world. In verse 4 through 16. It seems that the writer Jude is making that very point. Jude is talking about a particular group of folks. Who were pressuring these Christians. And if we had the time we would drill down. But if you look in Jude. You'll notice that they're uh, shown to us. They're revealed to us throughout the epistle. First of all they are certain people. In verse 4. And you can draw your line down through the the book. They're these people that we read about in verse 8. They are these people in verse 10. It is them in verse 11. It is these in verse 12, verse 14, verse 16, and verse 19. And so you're reading about the same people as you read throughout the epistle. And if you want to use a word to characterize them other than what Jude uses, it's the world. And an interesting thing is done by Jude as we see these people revealed to us. They are described for us in verse 8 as having three characteristics. And think very carefully about the characteristics that they had. The first thing that characterized the world, these people, these certain people, is that they defiled the flesh. And as you look at what that means in context, it seems to be talking about corruption sexually. They were sexually deviant. They had left God's pattern and God's law with regard to the sexual relationship. He, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7. And he says, these teachers that were pressuring the church, they are just like those deviant ones in verse 7. And if we think about our culture today... We see the the world today as those who have defiled the flesh. They are serving their flesh. They are willing to change God's law with regard to sexuality in any number of ways. We certainly, we think about uh, homosexuality. But we would think about the rate of divorce. We would think about issues like abortion. And we would think about cohabitation. All of those in some way stem from a deviation from God's law with regard to sexuality. They defile the flesh. But number two, we see that they reject authority. They deny the Lord God and their only Savior, Jesus Christ. If they had no respect for his authority, whose authority would they respect? 
They're not going to respect, and Jude says, they don't respect the authority of the apostles, and they don't respect the authority of Jude. They see themselves as the end-all authority. They will look beyond themselves to no one to tell them what to do. If we were to look at 21st century America, we see that. We see the world who rejects any source of authority outside of themselves. If it's specific to religion, or if we broaden it to social issues in the national platform, we see people saying, I'm going to do it my way. But then there's a third characteristic. He says that they speak evil of dignitaries. And while there's a bit of difficulty in understanding exactly what Jude has in mind, it relates to the other two. These things fall in a series that the writer Jude is talking about. And as he says that they speak evil of dignitaries, there's a chief concern and reason why. And that's because they are focused on themselves, on satisfying themselves. If you want to summarize verse 10, they corrupt themselves. If you look at verse 12 and summarize that, they serve only themselves. They don't care about God. They don't care about the angels. They don't care about these Christians. It's all about them. And again, as we look at our culture, we see that same mentality. There's even bumper stickers that say, it's all about me. We are me deep in self. And so as Jude is talking about the people that are troubling them in their time, he points to these three characteristics. But as he does so, he also shows us that it's not new. You'll see the examples that he gives, right? He talks about people in other times who did the same thing and are viewed by God in the same way. There were the Israelites who left Egypt. And they went uh, in through the wilderness and they abandoned the faith and they were destroyed. So there are people in that generation. You step out into eternity in verse 6 and there are the angels who left their proper abode and they face judgment. They are like these ones, verse 6. And then there's Sodom and Gomorrah who went after their own desires of their flesh. That's yet another generation of time. And then Jude gives us examples of individuals like Cain and Balaam and Korah. They are all characterized the same way. And here's the point. The world has always been the world. In verse 16, Jude describes the people of their time. And he says that they're grumblers, they're complainers. They uh, serve their flesh. They speak great swelling words of vanity. They seek to gain an advantage of you. They're no different than the people in those other times. This is not just a word to discourage or to warn them. Can you see that Jude is saying this because he wants to encourage them? When you look at your day, you think, man, it's never been any worse than this. And we realize that people have been saying that probably since the first generation of time. It's never been worse than this. But what Jude is saying is, look, what do you expect of the world? Where's your standard for them? Here's what you need to see. The world has always been the world. Peter speaks about this. You remember that in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12? These fiery trials that are coming upon you. Why do you look at that as if it's some strange thing? This is how it's going to be. The world is going to be the world, and we should not expect more than that. If Solomon was writing a commentary on the book of Jude, he might say something like this. That which has been is what will be. That which has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. As we would look and, and see what he would indicate to them. He shows them that the world has always been as it was. Peter tells them, again, back in 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, that they were pilgrims and strangers in this earth. I've heard someone say, we're not pilgrims of this earth trying to make our way to heaven. We are pilgrims of heaven trying to make our way through this earth. As we look at ourselves in reference to the world, we should expect that the world's going to behave the way it's behaving today. Jesus in John chapter 15 and verse 19 speaks to his disciples and he says, If you were of the world, then the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, even as I am not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And you remember when Jesus speaks to his father in John chapter 17 and verse 4, he says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 
What Jude is saying is, if you are suffering, don't be discouraged and don't be surprised. It has always been that way. I read about an Australian parachuter by the name of Rod Milner. I don't know if any of you remember this. It was in the news. He was a, a shooting star for a while. He uh, had decided that what he was going to do was to be the first person to parachute from outer space. Now, here was his elaborate plan, and the reason was, he said, every mountain has been climbed. He said, every sea has been swam, so I'm going straight up. His plan was to get on a helium balloon and go all the way to the edge of outer space and to jump 150,000 feet back down to earth. The experts immediately were telling uh, everybody that this was a death wish. There's no way that this can happen. But he was going on a grand tour all over Australia, getting international interviews. And on one occasion, with such self-confidence, he he stood in front of a a classroom of Australian children. And here's how he explained he was going to do it. He said, I will basically be aiming for the earth and trying to hit it. Fortunately, he chickened out. And he lived to be the butt of a whole lot of jokes and to leave sponsors millions of dollars in the hole. That was foolish. And yet how many people are spending their entire life just aiming for this world? C.S. Lewis said, aim for heaven and you get earth thrown in. Aim for earth and you get neither of them. Jude's warning about the ungodliness is that the that worldliness is costly. The world has always been the world, but they have always faced the same end. If you'll look through the epistle, you find Jude over and again talking about what the world has as a prospect out before them. He says, for example, they will be destroyed, verse 5 and verse 9. He says that they face eternal bonds, verse 6. They face the judgment of the great day, verse 6 and verse 15. They face the punishment of eternal fire, verse 7. They face perishing, verse 11. They face the black darkness that has been reserved forever, verse 13. And they face conviction in the judicial or the legal sense, verse 15. A couple of years ago, I was uh, up in Twin Falls, Idaho, and I had the occasion to go downtown to see the Snake River Canyon. It's, it's beautiful. This was the site of Evil Knievel's 1974 attempted jump. I mean, this was a big deal. And he got there, several days before he got there, from what I understand, several other folks came there, and there was a lot of violence and alcohol and nudity and profusion. It was Woodstock without the peace and love, and, and they were rebel rousers in the town. And finally, Evil Knievel and, and news crews all showed up for this great jump across this unbelievable chasm. And he, if you remember... It lasts about three or four or five seconds because his chute comes out early. Some say he chickened out, and he lands in the river down below. You talk about hype and then no follow-through. I think a lot of people who encounter the language of Scripture with regard to that great and final day see it as a bunch of hype, but it is going to live up to the billing. Because every person of every nation is going to be there and everyone is going to fall on their knees. Jude, in speaking about judgment and eternity in reference to all of us, of course, but certainly with regard to the world who was tormenting them and teaching them a different message, he is encouraging them by saying the world has always been the world and that's what prospect they face. But then second, I want you to notice with me a second truth for us to remember as we work our way through the epistle. And that is that God has always designed the church to be different. In verse 17 through 23, there is a thrilling moment. If you read all the way through the book uh, of Jude, and it doesn't take you very long, there's a change of note. There's a change of tenor in his message. He says, but you beloved... This is how it is for them, but here is how it is for you. Two times he says that in the epistle, and there are three admonitions that he gives out of that particular shift in his focus. He's left the world now, and he's talking about the church. And he says it has always been intended to be different for the people of God. The first admonition that he gives them is, remember the words of the apostles. Verse 17. In essence, what he is saying is, remember their warning about these ungodly mockers. 
The apostolic teaching was clear about the characteristics of these teachers. They were, were divisive. They were worldly minded. They were devoid of the spirit according to verse 19. They were troublemakers whose message separated people from God. Nothing is more powerful and nothing is more effective and more needed when we're tempted to follow the world than to see them for exactly who they are and to remember what God's word says about them. God says, you have the message. You know what God's word is and his will is. And so you are, are, are armed. Again, I think about because of the, the similarity between Second Peter and Jude. You find statements that Peter make that are so complementary with what we read in the book of Jude. In 2 Peter 1, 12 and 13, he says, I'm stirring up your mind by way of reminder. I'm reminding you. He says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 1, he said, The second epistle I'm writing unto you so I can stir up your sincere or your pure minds by way of reminder. Why do you need a subject like this? Why do we need to cover these particular things from different angles, looking at different books? Why do we need to hear lessons that we've heard before? Why do we need to talk about some of those fundamentals? Because we need that reminder. It's easy for us to forget. And it doesn't take us long to forget. If we stop teaching and talking about those matters that are fundamental to God, things like Eric mentioned in that last hour, we will lose sight of them. They're not pleasant and fun for us to have to preach about, to preach about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, or the kind of music that God wants in worship, or the undenominational nature of the church, or the reality of the judgment. But we need those lest we forget, and we quickly do. And we think because we've heard them several times, we forget about new Christians. We think about those who are young, who are growing up. Judges chapter 2 and verse 10 talk about Joshua. And all of those who were in his generation, they went to their fathers. And there arose another generation that knew not God of the things which he had done for Israel. The first admonition that he gives to the church to indicate to them that it is meant to be different for them is remember the words of the apostles. And the second admonition is to keep yourselves in the love of God. We see that in verse 21. Now he tells us how to do that in practical terms. You have an imperative there and you have three participles that tell you how you keep yourself in the love of God. Now there's a lot of ways to do it. But here's what Jude says right here. He says you keep yourselves in the love of God, number one, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. I wonder if there are those who are earnestly and sincerely keeping themselves in the book, if there are those who in such a frame of mind fall away from God, but I can't imagine that many would. If we are keeping ourselves in the love of God, building ourselves up on our most holy faith in verse 20, it's the building material for endurance. But he also says that you keep yourselves in the love of God, praying in the Holy Spirit. As we pray to God and we keep that lifeline and we audibly and we tangibly express to God our dependency upon him, we are going to be doing what Jude is telling the church that they need to do, keep ourselves in the love of God. And the third admonition is to do so waiting anxiously for the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that in verse 21. There's so much emphasis on the judgment and judgment for the world is going to be eternal fire. But judgment for the believer who is faithful is going to be eternal life. Scripture tells us repeatedly, you even have it somewhere in your building. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. The psalmist says the same thing in Psalm 130 and verse 6. So now Jude is talking to the church. And he says, it has meant God has intended it to be different for you. Remember the, admin, the words of the apostles and keep yourself in the love of God. And his third admonition is to have mercy on some and save others. You know, as we learn about and grow in our faith in Jesus Christ as children of God, we realize that it's more than about ourselves. That we are doing more than trying to preserve our own faith. We are trying to strengthen those around us, to reach those that are lost, to help our brethren be in a right relationship with God. If you'll look at this epistle 
as a note of encouragement as well as a note of warning, you realize that it is one way for the world, that the world has always been the world and they face the prospect of being that way, but God has always intended it to be different for the church. But I love the third one most of all. In times like these, we need to see that God is in control. In verse 24 and 25, that's the blessed assurance with which Jude ends this letter. A few years ago, our lectureship theme was, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And that we know that verse, Psalm 11 verse 3, but you know what verse 4 says? The Lord is in his holy temple. His eyes are upon the ways of men. We see these things going on, and as society erodes morally and ethically, we begin to wonder, at least in our worry and concern in our flesh, where is God in all of this? Don't you think they felt that way in Jude's day? As these false teachers were seeming to creep in unawares and to, to do their damage, and no doubt some were pulled away from the faith if all things were equal. They thought everybody is, is leaving their senses. Jude reminds them that God is still in control. Jude goes from a lost world to the saved saints, and he moves from the saints to the Savior. If the problem is what the ungodly are and what the ungodly do, then the solution is who God is and what God does. There are three notes of blessed assurance in those last two verses that talks about the control that God has over everything. The first note of blessed assurance is that God is able to keep you from stumbling. Keep yourselves in the love of God and he will not let you fall. God is able to keep you from falling away. If you partner with him in your spiritual life, you're going to make it through. I don't know what's going to happen in this world. I don't know what's going to happen in this nation. But I do know that God is able to keep you from stumbling. And I also know the second thing, and that is that God is able to make you stand in the presence of his glory. We are all going to stand at the judgment. And I know there's a sense in which every knee shall bow. But for the child of God who is faithful, who has put their life in God's control, they're going to be able to stand on the basis of the mercy and the grace of Jesus. And I think about how amazing that is when I think about the great prophet. And imagining the posture that he must have taken when he said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim, and each one had six wings. And with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the house shook at the voice of him who cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips." And uh, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. All of us fall abjectly before God. But there's a sense in which on the judgment day, if we have held on to our faith, that we're going to be able to stand in the presence of his glory. I'm a sinner. And I have earned eternal punishment. But my obedient response to his sacrifice is such that because of him... I can be found blameless. And what a joy I have the assurance of knowing that I'm going to be able to live with him in glory. The second note of blessed assurance in Corsicana, Texas in 2016 is that God is going to help you to stand in the presence of his glory. And if there's even something better that we can say, it's the last statement that gives us hope of knowing that God is in control as he has described. God is glorious and majestic, full of dominion and authority. All of my hopes are pinned on who God is. Is God any less omnipotent than he ever was? Is he less all-knowing than he ever was? Is he less all-present than he ever was? Because he is as he ever has been and always will be. I can handle anything because God is in control. It's interesting that we come full circle when we get to the end of the epistle because it begins by talking about the recipients as being those who are beloved in God. Emphasis on the word beloved. The word is found six times in this short 
epistle. This is how God sees us. We are his beloved. Emphasis on the word in. We have a safety, a protection, because we are beloved in God. This is similar to that admonition in verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And of course, we know that Scripture tells us we can get in a right relationship. We can get in position-wise in, in God himself. In Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For you are all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We clothe ourselves with Christ. We are beloved in him. There's safety. I think of Jesus' statement in John chapter 10 and verse 29 that we are in the Father's hand. We can jump out ourselves, but no one can take us out of the hand of our Father. An emphasis on the word God. Do you realize that every time the name of God is found in the epistle of Jude, the subject is salvation. Test it. Beloved in God, verse 1. The grace of God, verse 4. The love of God, verse 20. God the Savior, verse 25. I come to appreciate that this God who is in control is a God who has secured my salvation so that whatever rises and falls, whoever occupies the White House or the Senate or the Congress or the, the, the appointees that we're so worried about in the Supreme Court, God is in control. So often we feel so small. In comparison to this world. There was a fellow by the name of Vinko Bogataj. A few of you might know who that is. Vinko Bogataj, you, you know who he is if you don't know his name. He was a contestant at the World Ski Flying Championship in Germany. I think it was in April of 1970. And the conditions were bad and they were getting worse. And they'd already had two runs. Those guys were just fine. And he was in the third run. And... Uh, they went ahead and told him he had to go. And he found out pretty quickly that the conditions were terrible. And as he tried to control his body, he flew out of control. Now, here's why you know him. Jim McKay. An ABC wide world of sports. Every week, I remember as a little boy watching this, there was the catchphrases in that McKay voice that only he could say. And it would talk about the thrill of victory. And you know, that picture changed. It might be a World Series team or it might be a Super Bowl or some great moment in sports. It was ever changing. But the agony of feet, that was always poor Vinko Bogotaj. As his skis are flying end over end. How would you like to be forever known as that guy? You know, when the world looks at you and sees you here this late on a Monday night of the lectureship, they're thinking that you're in the midst of a tumble. In a way, is the world views it of defeat. We don't relish this thought, but you realize that it's the opposite. Because the world, and, and until we can share the message and, and save others with mercy, where they are if they refuse to come out of that place, is on their way to the ultimate defeat. You know, as, as I look at the epistle of Jude, it epitomizes the message of the entire Bible. Because it tells us in one short chapter as we divide the Bible, the message of the Scripture. The world has always been the world. God has always intended it to be different for his people. And brethren, no matter what, God's in control. J.C. Penney was a man who started a department store in 1902. It still bears his name over 100 years later. He lived to be 95 years old, and right before he died, he said this. He said, my, my eyesight is weakening but my vision is increasing. And as we journey through the land, singing as we go, we realize that the struggle may get greater, but our vision can increase. We should be able to see heaven more clearly every day, no matter the conditions of this nation. This evening, it may be that someone, in view of the great need of life, realizes that they have not heeded that warning and find themselves in need of responding, leaving the world and coming into the light. If that's because you have never yet made the decision to become a Christian. To act on what the Bible says to do. 
in order to become a child of God, to believe that Jesus is God's son, to repent from sins, and to be baptized. We're going to give you that opportunity in a song of invitation that's going to be sung. If you're a child of God who's weakened in your faith and you'd like us to pray with you, if you'd like to make a new resolve to serve the Lord with a whole heart in view of the end so that you on that great day can stand before the presence of his glory because of Christ, then we want to give you that opportunity right now as we stand and sing this.